to say, I feel like every time I come up to preach, I say, what an amazing series we are in. And I feel like I'm going to say that again. What an amazing series we are in. The parable series for this summer is extraordinary as we are diving deep into God's truth, and it is cutting deep. I don't know how about you, but I am being so convicted, and I am changing from the inside out, saying, God, I want you to do a fresh work in my heart. Are you all with me on that? Yeah, we want God to do something new, something fresh in our lives to make us more like him. For parables explain who Jesus was and what he was up to. And parables are treasures waiting to be discovered. So this summer, we are in for a lot of treasures to be discovered. For they unpack the surprise of God's kingdom, God's God's upside-down kingdom, and that God's kingdom requires a decision. For God moves in unexpected ways, through unexpected people, in unexpected times and places. Amen. And together we looked at the parable of the landowner, exploring God's love and grace. And Pastor Jay beautifully unpacked this as he brought that it flowed from the Father's generosity, through the work of the Son, through the power of the Spirit, we are given a grace which is the opposite of what we deserve. Such amazing grace. Say that with me today. Such amazing amazing grace. Now today, if we teach this parable correctly, it's going to bring some clarity, but it's also going to raise a few questions, and that is okay. But I want to encourage each of us, as we listen and unpack this parable, to see it through the same lens of love as we did last week, even though it's going to be difficult. For in the parable today, I'm going to be covering two topics that are extremely difficult to talk about due to their level of the discomfort they bring. But stay with me. I want you to know, hope is woven through. The topics are hell and money. How did I get on this week's rotation? Well, here we go. Wild. Well, if this is your first time online in here, welcome to the family. You're at the family table where we're going to talk about things we don't want to talk about, but we need to talk about because it's important that we talk about them. It's necessary and critical. In The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis once said, there are two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that constantly and seriously desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek find and those who knock, it is opened. Now this is a sobering message, but I want you to know that God loves us so much He gives us the truth, and he's made a way. So we're going to unpack all of this together. For Jesus never backed away from talking about money or hell. In fact, he talked about these topics a lot. For Jesus, hell was a reality and isn't a reality, and it is an actual place. It is marked by the absence of God's presence. Not merely a future reality, but a very present reality for those who've rejected God's invitation into his kingdom that have chosen deliberately to not believe and to live a life apart from him. Now, many have objected to the reality of hell, saying, how could a loving God send people to such a place like that? Well, I want you to know I agree with that statement, and I want you to hear these next words. Hell is not God's decision to live without you. Hell is not God's decision to live without you. Hell is rather your decision to live without God. He allows us to make the choice for ourselves. He made his choice, and his choice was for you. He 
chose you. God did everything possible to make a way for you to have everlasting life with him and to never, never be separated from his love. God made a way for you to be with him forever. But ultimately, it is up to you and to I if we choose him and to choose to accept the gift of what Jesus did on the cross, the grace we did not deserve. Jesus' death for you and me is the greatest awe-inspiring gift that could ever be given. Such amazing grace. Say that with me again. Such amazing grace. And what I find absolutely remarkable is not only did Jesus come to die and pay the price and the penalty for our sin, but he came knowing that many would still choose not to believe and still choose to walk their own path and reject him. Yet, he came anyway. And to those walking down the dangerous road marked for hell, Jesus gave both an invitation and a warning. And those whom Jesus saw as being in great danger of walking towards destruction were in his quote, not mine, lovers of money. And just like hell, Jesus has plenty to say about the love of money. Now, I want to make a special note here. Please note that never once did Jesus condemn being rich or having money. Though many have tried to impose their own economic model into Jesus' teaching, he merely warns us of the spiritual danger that when, because of our love for money and comfort, we begin walking down a very destructive path. When we are lovers of money more than lovers of God, we actually walk down a far more destructive path than any of us realize. Because someone on the outside, someone who is rich and wealthy, does not seem to be in any spiritual danger. They look happy. They're comfortable. They're self-reliant. They're prosperous. May even give to charities. However... On the inside, there are certain tests with money that God will bring that will reveal the level of danger. And these are some of those tests with wealth. Who owns your savings account? Does God own it or do you? How easy does it come to you to give 10%, which is your tithe of your wealth, to the Lord? And if God directed you to sell everything that you had to give away as a test of your love for him, even if it would be so difficult, could you and would you do it? For the point is, we hold everything lightly through our hands. All belongs to him. Luke 16, 13 says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. We cannot serve both God and money. Only one master will lead you down the path that leads to everlasting life. And all other masters will only lead you down a destructive road to hell, and there is no middle road. And at that very point, this very point, it brings us to our parable this morning. For as Jesus was warning his disciples about the dangers of being lovers of money more than lovers of God and the road in which it leads, it sets the stage for this parable with the Pharisees. Luke 16, 14 says this, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard what Jesus was teaching, and they ridiculed him. Now, the Pharisees were the elite religious in that day, and they carried the belief that a person's wealth directly correlated to how much they were favored and blessed by God. And here you have Jesus urging people to enter into the kingdom of God, warning against such a road which leads to death, and all the Pharisees are listening. They're laughing, and they're mocking. So Jesus tells them this story. And we're going to jump now into the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, found in Luke 16, 1931. So let's read this together. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. 
Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who pass would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now, this is the only parable with a person named in it, and his name is Lazarus. And Lazarus in Hebrew means Eleazar, which is God has helped. And his name choice is not accidental. This man's only help is from God and from no one else around him. And in contrast the Lazar to Lazarus, the rich man has no name. And I just want to say, isn't that symbolic of how God sees us? In heaven, the last shall be the first and the first shall be the last. We are all known to God. It's an upside down kingdom that moves in the opposite way of our world and culture. Now, this parable consists of two parts. The first part, verses 19 to 26, sets the stage of this parable and then narrates a reversal of fortunes in the afterlife for the rich man and for Lazarus. And the second part consists of a discussion between the rich man and Abraham found in verses 27 to 31 and ends with the rich man discussing and petitioning with Abraham for his five brothers to be rescued by a miraculous event. So let's dive into unpacking the first part of this parable. Well, the opening scene provides a brief description of the two men. They are two very different men in a have and a have not society, a two-tiered society. And we see this when the rich man is described that he was dressed in purple and fine linen. And this is signifying royalty, wealth, and great status. And in fact, there's a gate where Lazarus lay, means that most likely the rich man would have a very large house, a mansion, and there would be a gate, and that would be designed most likely to keep the have-nots out. And although he is certainly aware that poverty surrounds him, the rich man does not do or see Lazarus and alleviate his pain and suffering. Now, Lazarus, on the other hand, is said to have laid at the gate, and the word lay is to depict someone who is in a sickbed. He is vulnerable and very helpless. And the phrase desire to be fed with the amounts of scraps that fell from the table, in some commentaries it says in lieu of napkins, he used to take bread and throw it from the table. Now, the suffering of Lazarus compounds here. Dogs would come, and we read this, and lick the sores of Lazarus. Now, these are not your sweet, cute little pets that sit on your lap and sleep in your bed. These were wild, dangerous, disease-infested street dogs. Think of how degrading and think of how terrifying this would have been for Lazarus. And the licking was done continually, so it prevented his sores from healing, becoming infected, and causing great pain. Now, these details contrast someone who has absolutely everything with someone who has absolutely nothing. And their fate intersects because not only is Lazarus laying at this specific rich man's gate, they both die at the same time. Riches cannot lengthen your life, and neither can you take your riches with you into the afterlife. 
Now, we see now a reversal of conditions at death. The poor man, Lazarus, is carried away by the angels and escorted into heaven. And we read about additional scenes in the Bible where others are taken into heaven. Enoch was taken into heaven by God, Genesis 5. Elijah was taken to heaven in a whirlwind, 2 Kings 2. Now, I just came back from Canada's Wonderland and rode some epic rides, but that is a ride. That's amazing. Now, we read that Lazarus is with Abraham in his eternal resting place, being with Abraham in paradise, completely at peace. He is with the patriarchs. He is dining with the patriarch. Now, that is an amazing dinner party. We would not want to miss. Amazing. He is with Abraham in paradise. Lazarus dies, and I love this word when it talks about being carried. Lazarus is carried. What a tender word. He is carried by heaven by angels, unlike anything he experienced on earth. But the rich man dies and is simply buried. And we see even a contrast in their descriptions of death. So I want to just make a note here, a little pin, as Pastor Angela likes to say. I'm going to pin this. The story reinforces as well that there is no soul sleeping. And what I mean by this, and it's clear through the evidence of Scripture, that when the spirit or soul of each human upon dies, upon death, is immediately in either paradise, verse 22, or immediately in Hades, in verse 23. This is still true today. All of us will die and will instantaneously find ourselves in one of those destinations. And this is a decision that cannot be reversed after death. So we see here where Lazarus went. Now how about the rich man? Though buried, it says the rich man is immediately in a place of torment. He is in Hades. Verse 23 says, in Hades he lifted up his eyes. Now, Hades is a Greek word and a place. It's a place for the dead. It is of the dead and for punishment. Hades is a complete separation from God's very presence and essence. It is a very opposite of paradise, which is where God dwells and with those and also those that have gone before who have believed and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, Hades is different than hell. And let me explain. Hades is like a holding tank. It is a destination for those who die without Christ to be held in before they stand before the final judgment that is to come in the future. Now, the final judgment is referred to as the great white throne judgment. And this judgment is only for those who in this life, having heard, chose not to receive the gift of salvation through Jesus. Those that stand before this judgment will be guilty of their unforgiven sin. David Jeremiah makes note of this name, Great White Throne. Great speaks to the infinite one who is the judge. White speaks of divine holiness, purity, and justice. Throne speaks to the majesty of the one whom each one will stand before. Now at the great white throne judgment, Hades and all its occupants will be thrown into the final destination, which is hell, known as the lake of fire. Revelations 20, 13 to 15 says this, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now from this parable, how does it describe Hades? Now, words can never describe how horrific it will be. It says this in verse 23 that the rich man was in torment. It says in verses 24 and 25 twice that he was in agony, suffering, and flames. And this is totally consistent with every description of hell that Jesus gives. And by the way, Jesus gave more descriptions of hell than anyone else in the Bible. Hell, the lake of fire, will be the eternal destination of suffering apart from the presence, love, light, and grace of God forever and forever. And from this parable, we can see some hints regarding the world beyond as it existed, as it exists now, and as it will be. It also gives us a glimpse into the heart of God and what he, when he looked at these two men and what matters to him. 
The one poor in this life like Lazarus was rich in heaven. The one rich in this life was poor in hell. The one humiliated in this life was honored in heaven. And the one honored in this life is humiliated in hell. The one begging for crumbs in this life is enjoying a feast in heaven. And the one feasting in this life is begging for a drop of water. The nobody in this life is a somebody in heaven. And the somebody in this life is a nobody in hell. And the contrasts continue. You get the point. For this now brings us to the second part of this parable, the discussion between Abraham and the rich man. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Interesting that the rich man is asking for help from Lazarus while he's in Hades for Lazarus to come and serve him. But Abraham says, child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. This detail reveals that the rich man recognized Lazarus and knew his name. This confirms that the rich man was aware of Lazarus who lay at his gate. However, the rich man never spared a thought for him during his lifetime. He could have easily eased the agony of Lazarus on earth. But now Lazarus, it's impossible for him to ease his agony in Hades. The rich man's sin was not that he was rich. That was not the sin. The sin was indifference. His sin was indifference. A person like Lazarus cannot be written off and ignored by anyone who has inherited the kingdom of God. The rich man was a lover of money rather than a love of God. For if he was a lover of God, you would see the result in his genuine acts of love and compassion for his fellow man like Lazarus. It could be said that his love of money led him to neglect the very part of God's law that was so close to God's heart to care for the poor. Now the Bible is clear that God's concern for the poor is to be our concern. If God cares that much for the poor and needy, should not we? It's again why it's so important to get into God's word, to allow God's word to get into us, that we may be transformed as God's word becomes alive in us. His law becomes written on our heart that we may obey it and become more and more like the image of Jesus Christ. When you decide to live according to Christ's law, you will change. You will live differently. And you must choose to walk down a different path. And no wonder Jesus was so frustrated with the Pharisees, these lovers of money who claimed to be the ones who followed God's law better than anyone else. They honored God's with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. And I want to be clear. Wealth is not a measurement of one's standing and favor before God. Also, good deeds on their own are not one's measurement of favor and one's standing before God. The emphasis here is that wealth carries an obligation. It can be an incredible resource to help bless and grow the kingdom of God. And I just want to say to those of you that God has entrusted wealth, I want to thank you for sowing into the kingdom of God, for sowing into the body of Christ, for sowing into the needs that are around you. I want to acknowledge that. There is to be no condemnation today, but we are to feel the weight of the obligation that it brings because it is also an incredible danger if used wrongly when the unfortunate are ignored. The focus is on stewardship and obedience to whom much has been given, much is required. One standing before God will simply come down to relationship, receiving what Jesus has done. Do you know God and does God know you? As we pick up the parable, the second part of this parable is a discussion between the rich man and Abraham. First, he wants Lazarus to provide relief from his horrible condition, and the rich man's wish is not granted. And we see evidence in Scripture that there is a great chasm fixed between paradise and Hades. And the chasm between the rich man and Lazarus and Abraham is too great to cross. 
The fact that it is fixed means it is established by God. Having had unsuccessful reactions in his discussion, the rich man goes on to ask Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers. They must repent or they will end up in the same place of torment as him. And he says, surely they will repent if someone from the dead visits them. But the rich man's plea falls flat. Abraham says no. In John's gospel, when Jesus raised a man from the dead who also happened to be named Lazarus, it propelled a plot to kill Jesus, John 11. In Matthew, the story of the guards at the tomb, it only provoked the leaders to invent a lie after the resurrection and bribed the guards to squelch the truth in Matthew 28. Something more dramatic than a return from the dead must soften a hardened heart and bring revelation. That is something only the power of the Holy Spirit can do. The great gap between the rich and the poor in life is bridgeable. The life beyond the chasm widens and becomes unbridgeable. The parable's a warning to us who, like the five brothers, are still here on earth and have time that as we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth, faith rises in our hearts and we can repent and do the will of God. For the will of God has clearly been made known to us through the work of Jesus Christ. The gate around the rich man's mansion were outward barriers, barriers representing an inward barrier he had around his heart heart of indifference. We are to follow this example and not do what the rich man has done. The rich man was indifferent to Lazarus and wrote him off as a companion to stray wild dogs. And this parable encourages generosity and charity. However, it also implores us to go beyond charity Not just to see, not just to give, but to see the conditions of those who suffer and to see them as people created in the image of God, his children, whom he desperately loves and sees and also died for. This parable is not just about world hunger, but about the hunger of one man whose name the rich man knew who laid at his gate and he did absolutely nothing. The point is clear. A beggar once sick, hungry, no earthly possessions, becomes rich in eternity. Lazarus is indeed helped and comforted. All is made new and restored. The rich man, once healthy and wealthy and enjoying nothing but the finest, now suffers the worst torment in his death. The rich man's requests, his last requests, are denied. And Abraham stresses the impossibility of granting the request because of the great chasm. That gulf marks the finality of death and emphasizes now that it is too late. And after death now for the rich man is only judgment. And so, because Jesus loves us so much, He is warning us to repent for those of us that are still on earth and have time. We can still close that gap and run to the Father. The rich man had time to do the will of God until he had no time. Jesus is our hope. Jesus has come. Jesus has defeated sin and death forever and paid the price of our sin and the penalty of death upon his very body and through his blood. We have a great high priest. We have Jesus Christ, the hope of the world that has bridged the gap. Hebrews 9 27 says this, but as it is, he, speaking of Jesus, has appeared once and for all at the end of ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly wait for him. The focus of this parable is to remind us that what you do in life matters. The decisions you make have consequences. 
Wealth does not condemn one to hell, and neither does poverty propel one to heaven. Our destiny alone depends on our relationship with God and is directly reflected in the way we live. It overflows into our stewardship and our attitude with our material possessions that we have been given from God. They are His to be used to bless and to love others. Will you, what will you do with this invitation to follow God? This determines your eternal destiny. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. One day you will stand at death's door. Where will you go? You can have assurance of faith today to know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one that paid the price once and for all to rescue us, to give us hope. He has made a way. He has given us access to the very throne of God and has forgiven us of our sins that we can boldly approach the throne of grace and receive mercy in our time of need. For he will forgive our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We cannot earn it. We cannot strive for it. We cannot be good enough for it. We cannot do enough good works to earn our way to heaven. It is a gift of God, not by works, so none of us can boast. It is a pure gift from the heart of the Father. And this is the lens that you would never live and choose to live apart from his, his heart and his love and his light. He is here with us. He sees you. He has called you by name. You are his and he's laid everything down, his very son, to make a way for you. He has given it all for you to know him and his heart. For though, amen, <laughs> Woo. if any of us are here today or watching online that have never taken the step to say, Jesus, I believe that you came and died for me, and I want to make the decision today to follow you, we call it a sinner's prayer, a salvation prayer. We're actually all going to say this out loud together, but I encourage you, if you've never said this prayer today, and something's going off in your spirit, you know that's called the Holy Spirit. And he's starting to go right into your spirit heart because this is a revelation that can only come from God, not from just words. It's through the power of the Spirit. If you're feeling that for the very first time, that is God tugging on your heart, saying, I'm here. This is truth. Take the step of faith. The step of faith. So church, would you pray this prayer out loud with me? And I'm going to say these words, and I would just be honored if we can just pray this prayer. Father God, I admit that I am a sinner in need of your grace. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins. I receive this gift of eternal salvation. I come to you now. Take control of my life. I give my life to you. Help me to live for you every day. To obey you. Show you my love. Show you my thanks. I commit my life to following you. Thank you that I will spend eternity with you. Amen. The greatest prayer ever to pray. Ever to pray. This is the hope of the world. This is the hope of the world. This is our hope. Not just of the world. Our hope. Amen. So in closing, I leave you with a few questions. Is there anyone laying at your gate? Is there anyone in proximity to you right now that you can go beyond not just scraps from your table, but to truly bless and show God's love? 
and ask God to show you. It may be a monetary thing. It might be your time, your talent. Ask God as well. Are you walking down the right path? If Jesus were to walk alongside of you, would it be a word of encouragement or a word of warning? Both are an invitation to his love. And at this point in the service, it'd be, I wanted to take a moment to do an action step together as a church family. Because when Jesus got a hold of our lives, it wasn't just about us. He has told us to go and make disciples, to go and preach the good news. This is the good news. And this is why we've been parachuted into life for such a time. God got a hold of us and we are on commission. And that commission is his word, salvation, is the greatest news, the greatest hope, the greatest decision to a world that is left in darkness without the light of Jesus. And so in your life right now, I think all of you have a popsicle stick that you received when you walked in. During Waiting Saturday, we took some time to just write names down that we are believing for salvation. And so right now, just take a moment and think, hey, God, I want to commit to pray for somebody or a group of people or a bunch of people, however many you want to write on your popsicle stick. But we want to take a moment to say, Father, I thank you that there is a light and a truth to be brought to this person, and I'm going to begin to pray. And I am going to believe, and if you don't feel an urgency for the lost to not come to know Jesus, ask God to put a fire in your bones for those who do not know him. That when you look at your neighbors, you look at your coworkers, you look at your friends at school, wherever you are, that you feel this burning heart to pray for people, to say they need to know Jesus. They need to know the love of God. God has placed you in your neighborhood. God has placed you in your workplace. God has placed you in your family, not just about you, but to bring the light of Jesus. Jesus, where you are. And for some of you, that's really hard because you think if only you knew my family, if only you knew my workplace, God is going to use you and is using you and will use you as you open your life and say, I surrender. Use my life, God. And I'm going to begin to pray. I'm going to begin to get on my knees and declare salvation over my family, my friends, my coworkers. So right now, I know God's already putting names on your heart. So we're going to take a moment here. And when you come up, write the, we got some Sharpies at the front. I'd love for you to write your names on those sticks. Leave them at the altar. The prayer team's going to take them. The pastors are going to pray. The prayer team's going to pray. And we are going to believe for a beautiful harvest of revelation for people to experience Jesus and his love. God's love is so good. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So as the team plays this next song, please feel free to come and to lay your sticks at the altar. God bless each of you. What a beautiful morning we've had together. Mm -hmm.